All right, we're going to get back and get started. Um, Mark and Tony have an, an action-packed uh, presentation, and so we want to make sure that we're being respectful of everyone's time. So I am going to get right to it, and I'm going to introduce um, Mark Majors and Tony Turner, and also would like to let everyone know that if you didn't see it in the chat, you might want to scroll back. Um, uh, Mark asked that we all fill out a short survey that, that they have. It was very quick. I did it, and uh, they're going to be using it during their presentation. So um, Mark Majors is an author and lead user experience researcher at Progressive. In addition to holding a master's degree in information architecture and knowledge management with an emphasis in user experience design, he is certified usability analyst, HFA, uh, HFI, and UX certified from Nielsen Norman Group. His skills range from user research, interaction design, digital strategy, conversion rate optimization, and usability testing. He's a board member of UXPA Cleveland and Better World Day. Um, and there's more information at his website, which is listed in his profile. Um, and Tony Turner is a lead user experience researcher at Progressive. In addition to holding a degree in cognitive science, he is a certified user experience analyst and certified usability analyst through HFI, Human Factors International. Sherry, I should be slapped on the hand for not reading out the full names and giving you abbreviations. Tony focuses on the full range of qualitative research methods such as usability testing, observations, and surveys. Uh, more information can be found at Tony's website, which is also listed in his bio. Um, and with that, I will go straight to Mark and Tony. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Very excited to be here. And today's talk is using curiosity to build innovative products. And we have to three top level bullet points that we would like to share with you today before we dive into our story. One is we want to share with you the value of UX research. Then we want to talk about tips on how you can ask questions and then why it's important to ask them in the right way. So you're going to be seeing us focus on these three key points today as we walk through our, our presentation. But I wanted to start with a story. And I don't know how many wedding sessions you've been to, but have you been to one where it's like, you know, hey, everybody, come on out to the dance floor. It's empty. <laughs> and the first wedding reception I ever did, so straight out of college, I did my first wedding reception and this exactly happened to me. I arrived to the hall and there was another DJ that was set up exactly in the same space. And I was like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. So I walked up to him and he's like, you know, I'm in the right wedding. I said, well, are you doing the Jones Brown wedding? They're like, no. I'm like, well, then you're next door. So I helped him move all his equipment out. <laughs> then I hooked up my equipment and I started playing songs as soon as dance beginning and nobody was dancing. And I tried to figure out why. So I finally walked up to the couple and I said, hey, uh, is there anything you want to hear? And they're like, well, we want you to recreate the bar. We hired you because we saw you playing in, in our bar. And I was like, oh, so you want me to recreate the bar? So then I asked some more questions and I started realizing that I needed to dim down the lights. I needed to play the music sets that I was playing in the bar, the, the, the hard rock and the, you know, the rap sets and everything I did. Then I actually asked the bartender who was on one of those wheelie carts, can you wheel closer to the dance floor? All of a sudden, within moments, the dance floor was packed. Everybody was out there. So I started realizing very quick that my day job as a designer was very similar to my weekend job as a DJ, that I always had to figure out a way to pack the dance floor. Because if the dance floor isn't packed, everyone's, well, you're not doing your job. And as, as a DJ, you don't feel you're doing the best job. And Sherry went through some good examples, and Michael and Emily went through some good examples about how to think about that product that you're creating and how to apply those principles and the same principles I discovered that you can apply to DJing actually translate 100% over to user experience design. And it reminded me of my next story. So that was on a Saturday night. I did this wedding, my first wedding. And then fast forward to Monday, I walk in through the doors, I sit at my desk, and this gentleman walks up with his agent. And 
This is Robert Lockwood Jr. He's one of the founding members, you know, of, of blues. He's, he's got a really long legacy. And so I, I reminisce back to what happened to me that day, just a couple days ago. And I remember, oh, I, I've got to ask some key questions about what experience that he wants to create. And he said, you know, I want to create a live experience. So I went together and I, I, I uh, kindly asked him, do you mind to come out to a couple of your gigs and take some photos and hang out? You know, I want to feel the full experience. <laughs> so I went out and I really tried to recreate his experience on a website because that's what he wanted. He wanted people to go to his website so he could draw people out to his live gigs. So that was his goal. And the correlation there came across that this user experience professionals and DJs, they share very similar techniques. And it started making me think like, could this, is this something, could this be a concept? So put my, you know, head down, started working on a lot of different ideas and, you know, came together and we're going to talk more about this philosophy, but it all started me thinking about, you know, how do you discover what people need? Because what somebody needs is different than what they actually want there's there's two different things there and all organizations yeah no matter what it is they have a product a system or some process they're trying to promote and it all comes down to that you need to step into the user's shoes so you've heard this a lot today it's like oh, i need to step into the user's shoes so just like a dj i have to figure out how do i get people out there on the dance floor how do i figure out what they need the same thing with a product but I want to take it one step further. It's, but do you know your users down to how they put on their shoes? What I mean by that is, do they, are the laces already tied and they're just slipping their feet into them? Are they, do they start by putting the left on first, then the right? Do they, are they very uh, precise how they actually tie a knot? You know, is there, is it a very precise way? Are they Velcro shoes? You know, there's, there's all these things about, do you know the, down to the finest detail? Because that's the detail that you're going to need to actually produce a product. So we're going to dive in really fast and just talk about the value of UX research. And it comes down to choosing the right method. There's a lot of methods out there. So first, you've got no prototype. So I, I don't even have an idea of what I should build. Well, that's generative research. You're going to do a lot of techniques there. Then I've actually have a prototype now. I built something and I want to get feedback on it. That's evaluated. And then there's always group feedback. You can always put your you know, foot in and understand and get an idea of a poll of how people are feeling. And it comes down to that, that research requires effort. We put a poll out here. How frequently do you use ability tests? And it seemed like the commonality was monthly. And there was a segment of folks that never use ability tests. And... That is a level of effort. You'll see here on this generative UX research reliability versus effort chart that assumptions are in that far left corner. They're off the chart. But there are things you can do when you're trying to figure out what people need that require low effort. And there's things that as you go up and you start actually talking to people, which is the active phase at the top, then there's more reliability. But you'll see the effort exponentially create, you know, goes up higher. And the same with evaluative. So once you have the prototype and you're going to put it in front of somebody, once again, assumptions are off the chart, but there are many techniques that you can do that do not require as much effort. But as you see, more effort, more reliability, and that's all going to depend on timing. But the thing that goes through all of those is curiosity. And that's the feature of today's your theme is this curiosity and curiosity means asking questions. When we kicked off today's session with some books, there was some great books that were suggested there about how, how to drive questions and do that. And I started thinking about the last time I bought a car and I noticed that the sales associate asked questions in a very specific way. They used a pattern of questioning. And it was because they were trained to do that. They, were, they have to ask questions in a very specific way. And now that question set is trying to create an experience 
at that dealership. You may have noticed this when you go into the dealership now, it's just not about service anymore. It's we have the best lattes. We have the best children's playroom. We have all these amenities because now they're trying to create an experience. And Joseph Pine talked about this progression of economic value that in the beginning, we started taking you know, commodities, extracting out of the ground. Then we turned them into products. Then we started saying, well, we've got this product. We've got this car. We've got the better service. But now it's, we've got the better experience. Now, I don't know what's next in this progression of economic value, but the reality is that it's, there's always going to be some effort to figure out what the user's needs is. And this is the balance of UX, is that user experience has business goals. Every business knows you have some kind of goal they're trying to create. There's always a technical constraint. So we know, oh, well, you know, I only have so many hours or, or you know, we've, we're locked into this content management system. But finding the user's needs, that's generally the hardest thing for an organization to uncover. And that's why we want to talk to you today about how asking questions and carving out the time for UX research can help you move up your product. It's going to be a competitive advantage. You're going to create a pleasant, productive experience. And the key that most organizations, they smile from end to end, is that you're going to minimize rework. That rework is critical. It costs, I don't even know, probably millions of dollars every year to organizations if they could just catch it earlier rather than trying to fix it down because now I've got more people involved. So to build a proper experience, we're going to talk about asking questions. And believe it or not, thinking like a DJ, thinking of, of how you can keep the dance floor going, how you can keep things moving and understand it is the key. So we're going to talk today about how thinking like UX and DJing a wedding reception, how those there's a commonality there. And then also how asking questions with curiosity will help you figure out the needs. So we're going to dive in, but we need to introduce ourselves really quick. I know Carrie Ann did a quick intro, but uh, once again, Mark, I am... Uh, I'm a professional DJ, also put out a book, which we'll talk about, and then uh, I'm a UX researcher. But guess what? I'm joined here by also <laughs> Tony Turner. Tony, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, I'm Tony Turner, also a UX researcher, um, also a magician. So I volunteer with children's hospitals um, to do magic uh, for the kids there. So um, throughout the talk here, we're going to... Um, talk about this mantra. Um, so it's what just happened. Try imagining what they're doing to create clarifying questions so you can then investigate. So I wanna break that down a little bit. Um, so when we say try imagining what they're doing, um, we want you to apply this in your user research practices. Um, so obviously we talked about getting in the user's shoes, um, but there's a depth of that that you can reach if you start to think of yourself as actually doing the things that they're describing interacting with the things they're interacting with. When you do that, you'll find gaps um, in that imagination where you don't really understand or know what they would do in detail or specifically next. So, um, so when you think about those gaps, you can, you can develop questions that you can ask them so you can investigate further. So we'll talk about this throughout the, the session here. Yeah, you're gonna see this a lot and we're gonna do a sounder. We're gonna, every time we see this, you're going to see this a lot through it. We're going to, we're going to have the spaceship pass by, Tony. So um, quickly, um, Jen had mentioned, as Mark was saying, she brought those books. Um, she mentioned a book called Think Again by Adam Grant. And she had that quote, um, listen as if you are wrong. And I think that really applies to our mantra. So kind of keep that in mind too. Um, so, um, so you looked at some playlist uh, creation. Um, and we want to um, learn about how your playlist actually turned out. So that was the form that we had sent you. Um, so in the chat there, let us know how your playlist turned out. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of songs in here. I know Joe had asked, well, what's the playlist for? And I said, well, it's for, for my uh, 
grandfather's 80th birthday party. Well, that changed a little bit of the scope of it there, but there's a lot of good requests in here. And it is interesting when you're putting together a playlist, Tony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's something to uh, consider um, applying to um, any kind of creative endeavor. Um, so there's always a strategy. So when building a playlist, there's a strategy. You may not um, think about it that way, um, but there's a specific line of questioning that maybe you just ask yourself or you ask someone else. Um, so, um, so you may ask yourself, um, what do I really like in terms of music? You may ask yourself, um, when do I wanna listen to this playlist? Um, if it's for someone else, like what are their um, issues in life or goals in life or what do they really like about things? So there's a strategy behind building a playlist and that kind of correlates to our DJ discussion and also to user experience design and research. So uh, what questions did you ask when you built your playlist? So back to the chat. Yeah, I heard somebody say, you, you know, I may ask myself that I was talking heads, uh, David Bird song. So yeah, it's just they even made a, a, a specific um, reference there. It looks like a playlist was self-reflective and just, you know, going off what uh, Cassini had said earlier, you know, throughout the keynote. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so we'll talk about some tips on how to ask questions. So we mentioned that mantra. Um, we, we mentioned that you would develop questions. So there are ways to ask those questions. Um, and we want to kind of investigate that. So we'll go through a few things. Um, the first one is planning the time. Um, so you want to kind of consider the context and the end user and what their goals are, and also what you want to learn from your questioning um, and plan out the time accordingly. Uh, we'll also talk about um, five whys. So that was mentioned earlier um, in the root cause analysis um, sort of um, strategy. Um, then we'll talk about PET, which is persuasion, emotion, trust. And it kind of gets at how people feel about a design or a product or a service. Um, we'll talk about humble inquiry. Um, so we're asking again that mantra, what just happened? And it's really about building a relationship with the participant. Um, and then we'll, we'll understand influences. So we'll talk about something called the story curve and we'll talk about attention span as well. So planning time, as I mentioned, um, you wanna um, consider um, the goals for your research and also the context and the end user goals. Um, so, um, so maybe you should um, kind of reach out early on, like Mark was saying, talk to them before the actual session and, and kind of get a high level understanding of, of what their issues are, what their needs are, what problems need to be solved. Discuss that with your team as well, stakeholders, and start to map out a strategy for, uh, for the research. Um, any kind of research that Mark had mentioned earlier involves this type of um, this type of planning. So think about it too with planning a wedding reception. Uh, Mark had talked about this. You know, we asked the people into the into the reception kind of what they would like to change or what they needed. So that's something to do beforehand as well. Um, so planning a wedding reception is is really similar. Um, so building a product, um, you need to ask those questions early on and understand what that plan is before you go in and dive deep into the, into the uh, research. So we'll talk a little bit about elements of experience. So there are a lot of different layers here. Um, and um, there's a top layer, there's a bottom layer. You think you can think of it um, like an iceberg, how there's the tip top and then um, there's all these layers underneath, a much larger sort of core foundation underneath. Um, so the bottom plane there is the strategy plane. Um, so that's when you're getting at user needs, site objectives. Um, a lot of questions come in at that stage and that's a really important stage we'll talk about later. Um, there's a scope plane where we talk about functional requirements and content requirements. Um, the structure plane, now you're getting into information architecture, interaction design. Um, so you're starting to get to the point where people are interacting with your system. Then you go up and you have the skeleton plane, which is the real navigation information design component. Um, and then of course, at the top, there's the visual design. So all of those things kind of run together and you have to ask questions to really develop each of these well. Yeah, I know we had a, you know, 
I think Michael and Emily talked about how this relationship, how these things work together. And this is a, a similar feeling is that you know, all these things have to work together to produce that experience. Mm -hmm. So what is consistent across all of these layers? Hmm. So you're always asking questions on behalf of the end user. So before we move forward, I want to talk about that um, on behalf of the end user component. Um, so when you're doing research, any kind of user research, you're talking with uh, one person or maybe a group of people about their experiences and their needs, goals, things like that. But you have to remember they're representing a larger group of people that will use the product. Um, so you're asking questions on behalf of that group. Um, so kind of keep that in mind and consider that as you develop your questions to ask people and, and think about that as you're imagining, like we said, with the mantra, putting yourself in that person's shoes and thinking about the nuances um, behind their experiences. So back to the mantra again. Um, what just happened? Try imagining what they're doing to create clarifying questions so you can then investigate. So just keep in mind that you want to put yourself in those shoes and really imagine yourself doing what that person is describing. So now we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about a user-centered design framework. You've seen a few of them today. Um, so this is just another way to visualize it. Um, so we have four stages here. The first one is identify. So you're identifying um, the problem, the issue, or the need. Um, you're conceptualizing a design, uh, evaluating that design, and then developing um, a solution to that design. Um, so that's one way of looking at user-centered design. Um, so when it comes to planning, the first two stages, identify and conceptualize, uh, that's kind of where you want to put the bulk of your user research and planning work. So you want to ask, develop a lot of questions to ask at that sort of um, brainstorming stage, that identify stage, and also conceptualizing designs when you're trying to um, build out some sort of solution to, um, to a problem. So now we have another question for you. Name something you tried you thought was easy but turned out to be hard. So I did put a poll question. I put a question in the chat for the stream, see if we get some replies there. But Tony, I know one for me that I always thought about was, oh, I thought it was so easy, like just, just paint the interior of some rooms. <laughs> and it turned out that while I had to tape down the trim, I had to put something over the floor, I had to move all the carpeting out. You know, I, there was, there were a lot of steps that ended up, I think, you know, I should, you know, I should be able to do that. Well, somebody put in uh, the chat cornhole. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. I didn't play cornhole until I got to Ohio uh, when I started college. Um, and I thought it would be easy too, but it was not. Um, I quickly realized that um, <laughs> something else, uh, tennis for me was something I thought would be easy. I've been an athlete for a long time, so I tried it out also in my adulthood. Um, and I saw Serena Williams, looks like, you know, it's pretty straightforward. But uh, I would hit the ball over the fence and stuff, or I would not hit it hard enough to uh, get it over the net. So it was very challenging. Um, so, There's yeah, there are other I see uh, uh, Tisha and Jennifer have uh, cross country skiing. I know I tried that too. I got the skis and I thought, oh, it should just be like downhill, downhill skiing. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. And karaoke was in here too by Joseph. Uh, I tried that too. I went up there thinking I was going to be like David Lee Roth or something. And uh, I sat down with my head down. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so there are a ton of things like that. Um, so we think um, asking questions on behalf of the user uh, is similar. Um, it's something that really takes a lot of practice and understanding um, nuances of how to interview someone. Um, it can go wrong pretty easily. Um, you may not even realize it's gone wrong and you may not realize you're getting at, you're not getting at the uh, research answers that you're looking for. Um, but there are tips and tools that you can learn. And as long as you practice, you'll, um, you'll develop those. So question, are you asking questions the right way? So here are some techniques for you to apply. Yeah, we're gonna be talking, we're gonna be spending a lot of time on the expectations. So trying to uncover, you know, users' needs, which is 
really that mental, you know, that mental model that shapes us. We will talk about some of the influences, but that's really only like 20% of what we're covering today. We can go down a whole path around really what are things that influence people and how they make decisions, but we're going to be spending a lot of time in the expectations part right now. Uh, so the first thing we want to talk about, um, so Michael and Emily talked about this, the five whys root cause analysis system. Um, so it's a method of problem solving where you try to get at the essence of a problem by um, digging deep into that problem. So, um, so the first component to think about is um, kind of um, the fact that it can be a proactive or reactive um, a reactive sort of direction. So you may have a problem that hasn't happened yet. So it's a proactive approach um, and you are um, kind of investigating solutions to that problem before, um, before it's happened. Can be reactive as well. So you find an existing problem and users are experiencing or some problem in the system um, and you're reacting to that. So you're looking to find solutions to those problems. Um, so also the problem must be well-defined and documented. So if you're gonna dig deep into a problem, you need to really have that problem well-defined. Um, as I talked about earlier too, there are a lot of different directions you can go when you're doing the five whys, and you should um, ask those questions to those directly associated with the problem. That initial problem has to be well-defined. Um, and in order to ask those questions, in the, in the way that's gonna uh, really pull out all the different nuances and different things that different people are thinking about, you wanna have a core problem statement. So as you see here, uh, you get into deeper and deeper problems as you ask, why is this happening? Um, so you could say, I'm hungry, why is this happening? Well, I haven't eaten today, why is this happening? Well, I'm working myself to the bone, et cetera. So you get to a root cause, which is the fundamental essence of that problem. So then you can start to build up to a solution from there. Right. And, you know, as Tony mentioned, there's a lot of nuance that goes into that. And it's, it's similar to this methodology of PET. Yeah. So PET is persuasion, emotion, trust. Um, so, um, so we mentioned those certifications that we got from Human Factors International. Um, so PET is, is one of those foci. Um, so it's a method of understanding feelings about a design. Um, so it's really investigating, um, investigating how people react to things and how to build out um, a design to match their particular worldview and how they react to things. So thinking about um, the drivers that will drive them to make a, a decision to purchase or any kind of conversion and things that detract from those things. So, so if you want to look more into that, um, hit up Human Factors International. Um, you can learn more about persuasion, emotion, and trust. Right, but it is another really clear framework that can really help you think about, as we were saying with our mantra, understanding how to ask questions on the end user's behalf. And this is another one, Humble Inquiry, which is Edgar Sheen is the author of this book. And it's really a method of relationship building. And I recently discovered this book and I, I was blown away. I think that if you can ask questions where you do not know the answer. So the book focuses on the fact that we are in a telling culture. We always want to tell somebody something, but how often are you listening? How often are you trying to be engaged with the end user and really try to figure out what they are thinking. And this methodology goes down this path that you, it's okay not to know the answer, that having some of that vulnerability, and I think our keynote speaker talked about that as well, uh, and having that sense of authenticity, curiosity, empathy. And you hear these words being thrown around, but if you are actually gonna reach out to someone and you don't know the answer, it's because you should be down deep inside trying to build a relationship. And building a relationship means that you're going to be vulnerable, <laughs> that you're not going to know everything. And it's okay. It's not a weakness. It's actually a strength to admit that you don't know something. And then you can build that relationship, solve problems, and move things forward. So this is a great another framework to think about when you're trying to build that relationship. And 
what this made me start thinking about that each research opportunity, every time I get to talk to a customer, every time that I get to you know, interface with an end user, it's like building a relationship because you want them to come back next time. You want them to be heard and you want to have, figure out a way so that you can understand what their needs are and factor that into whatever it is, your product, process, system, whatever you're building. So it leads into some overall question tips. And we're gonna do a little role play here in a minute. But what's interesting is that once you start figuring out, you'll see that all these methodologies, whether it's root cause analysis, PET, humble inquiry, is that you're balancing listening and asking questions at the same time. Because when you go in to interview an end user, observe them, even a usability test, you're going to be, there's going to be a period where you're going to be talking to an end user. There has to be a balance there. You have to be listening and then asking your questions. And one thing, Tony, I always find interesting is customizing questions. I know that's always something that's challenging. Yeah. So, um, so as you're kind of doing the interview, um, you may find that they say something in particular if you are listening, um, and you may want to dig deep into that. So, so you may come with a list of questions, but you'll want to be able to sort of be on your toes and ask follow-up questions and things like that throughout the session. So keep in mind what your research goals are, but also uh, try to learn as much as you can. And that also builds that empathy that Mark was talking about. Yeah, and then it rolls right into staying curious because if you're asking questions you know the answer to and you're asking them on behalf of the end user, then that curiosity is at that true intent, which is to improve the overall application and, and that'll allow you to dive deeper because now you've been able to ask some core questions. You've got the trust because you've been listening and now you can go you know, even deeper into the question set. And it's always better than assumptions. You saw on, on our initial onset that assumptions are off the chart. You want to be able to build straight from what an end user has told you. So, yeah, and quickly, those assumptions, um, you may have assumptions. They can be hypotheses for, for the uh, questions and the research you're doing. So you don't necessarily have to throw them away, but you can't use them in your design. You have to kind of um, confirm right. or um, invalidate those things um, as you go through. Exactly, exactly, good point. So we talked about expectations. We went down the path of, okay, so this is how I dive into the needs. What about some of the influences, Tony? Because we've got these nudges and obstacles that are out there. And one of my favorite books is Influence by Robert, Robert Taldini. Talks about a lot of these factors that we all as humans are influenced by. And one of them is the story curve. Yeah, so you'll notice in any kind of movie or book you've seen um, that there's a story curve. So that is um, a sort of way of laying out the plot of media um, or any kind of story, anything um, in a movie or a book. Um, so there's generally five minutes or so in an interview where you're building up um, an understanding of the person, building their relationship with them and kind of having easy ball questions, um, you know, that, that kind of help you um, develop that relationship. Then for 15 minutes and in a movie, it's longer um, or in a book, it's longer. You kind of um, get to a crescendo. So you're building, you're asking harder questions. Um, you're deepening that relationship and you're learning as much as possible. Again, putting yourself in that person's shoes, imagining what they're describing and developing an understanding of the gaps and the understanding you have about what they're describing. So all that's happening until you get to um, a crescendo of understanding that you're looking for as far as answering your research questions. And then it, then it kind of simmers down. There's 10 minutes of, of um, kind of asking some more questions to confirm things that you think you understand and just leaving off on good footing um, with the participant. Um, and yeah. so that's the story curve. And you'll see that, like I said, in a lot of different books and movies and things like that. And this is just based upon if you booked 30 minutes to interview someone, that's why it's broke up into this, these particular increments. But mm -hmm. the key here is that we're all susceptible to it. So you want to start off with, uh, you know, a kind introduction to work into it. And we will see shortly uh, 
how how that falls into some of the questioning. And that also goes into attention span. You know, the, an average goldfish uh, is about nine seconds. We are down to now about seven seconds, according to some research from Microsoft that goes back to 2015. Maybe it's even lower. Maybe it's even lower. I mean, you can see vines on here and they're long and gone, but TikTok and some of the other, you know, I guess social media is even less than, than seven seconds. So is our attention span even lower? So that leads into knowing that an end user only has a very short amount of time they're going to pay attention. So that's why you notice we'll try to do it in 30 minute blocks. If you start going longer, you're going to start losing people. And Sherry even alluded to it. There's, you know, you've got this uh, fatigue that's out there that's, that's happening to end users. And that's why we always subscribe to the, you know, keep it simple, superhero, <laughs> you know, keep it simple. Your questions, the things you're asking. We talked about some of the jargon you're using when you're talking to end users. Uh, that was brought up a lot throughout today. And that's why we're, we're going to jump right into why it's important to ask them the right way. <laughs> and like Tony was saying, this is years and years of training. It takes a lot to ask questions, pause, have the patience to continue to work with the end user so that you are continually listening to them and making sure things are clear. And it does impact the research. Yes, it does. And Tony, are you, you ready to do a little role play here? Yeah, for sure. Um, All right. So we're looking at building a new product. Um, so we found that a lot of uh, boaters, sailing folks are um, using a GPS system and they're using um, a different weather tracking system. Um, and we want to combine those. So that's kind of the, the product that we want to build. And we want to do some research to, um, to get an, uh, an understanding of the end users, potential end users and their needs. So Tony, I'm getting into character here. Uh, I've got my Hawaiian shirt on and I'm going to go ahead and put my captain's hat on. All right. And we will unveil, wait, we got the mantra. So once again, um, keep this in mind um, as you're doing research, try imagining what they're doing to create clarifying questions so you can then investigate. So pay attention to this, to this session we're gonna do and see if, uh, See if you think I'm doing a good job of that as I interview Mark here. All right, so as Tony gets into character, you're gonna be playing researcher? John Wayne. Researcher John Wayne. And this is my user persona. I'm Morgan Snyder. I am, uh, I'm retired and I'm just starting to get into boating. So I'm really jazzed and you can read over my stats here. And Tony, whenever you're ready, if you want to begin the, uh, we're doing a Zoom interview. Yep, Zoom interview. All right, I'm ready to go. All right, so uh, welcome, Morgan. Um, I'm John Wayne, uh, but you can call me the Duke. Um, so okay. your wife said uh, your wife said you need to do this interview because you're not great at sailing. Um, so that's oh boy, why doing this interview. oh uh, uh, well, I just started. I just got a boat, and I'm excited to do it. All right. So when it comes to sailing, you like to track weather, right? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, so as a novice, how would you describe um, how you track weather? Uh, well, I have an app on my phone. I pull up, uh, I think it's like weather app. And then uh, if I'm out on the boat, you know, I'll lick my finger and put it up in the air. Oh, and no, see no. which way that's, the wind's blowing. That's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. Uh, that's not really the right way of weather tracking. I have a product uh, that's going to help you do it the right way, though. Um, oh, okay. So um, another question, how would you use a combination GPS and weather device in three words? Uh, combination, what was a combination weather address? Yes. What? GPS device, oh, GPS. which is, uh, you know, how you get around, I oh, guess. Okay. Maybe, maybe you don't know that in your uh, age group, but uh, I guess a couple yeah, words to come to mind is, uh, you know, travel, uh, coordinates, and border. I don't well, want to go over none that. None of that makes sense. None of that makes sense. So we're going to close it out. Sounds like you really want this application that we're building. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, and we're good. Take care. 
Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right. So, uh, what what went wrong there? Probably John Wayne. Thank you, sir, the Duke, for the uh, interview. I'm going to get out of the character now. I'm going to take off my shirt, uh, my Hawaiian shirt, I should say. And so, if you see anything that went wrong there, uh, please drop some of them into our into veto there. We're going to show you a couple things here that you probably noticed out there. Uh, try not to use loaded questions. So did you, did you, <laughs> I see somebody said everything, everything is wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's you know, trying to interview thinks he already knows all the answers. And that's what happens is you, this first one here, trying not to use loaded questions, which is so you like that. Right. And I'm like, sure. <laughs> And, and then authority, you invoked uh, my wife uh, want, doesn't know I had a sale. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that was interesting. And you know, so you could see a couple others here. Any others jump out to you, Tony, that I know that you, you, you committed? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so people can't predict the future or their own behavior. Um, so I was asking uh, Morgan how he would um, use a combination weather and GPS app um, and obviously that was a struggle <laughs> right. question. So, um, yeah, so, so, and then, uh, uh, attempting to build a relationship. I did not attempt to build a relationship. Um, uh, so. I kind of came in as someone asking questions and left right. as someone that got the answers they wanted. And that was it. That was that. So, and we realize our examples are a little extreme, but there were, you know, throughout the years doing this, I've caught myself a couple times, you know, midstream throwing in a leading question. And then once again, this is one of those challenges where, you know, here's, here's some questions that possibly could have charted, charted the waters better, not to make a bad, uh, you know, naval pun. But if John Wayne might have said, what do you like or dislike? And going down this factor of, you know, what are your feelings? What are your thoughts about that topic? I know that one comes up a lot, Tony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and that's really important because you you kind of get rid of that valence on the question, um, so you, so you aren't prompting them to think about something they hate or something they love. You're you're just asking them what are their thoughts, and then they have to think about whether or not they like something or dislike something. Um, right. And then describing the process at a high level, uh, we did something similar, but um, I kind of said that he was a novice and. Um, I didn't say at a high level, which takes off some of the heat of going into detail. We can ask questions to dig into the detail as we put ourselves in those shoes. Um, but um, yeah, it's yeah. another technique is just asking them to describe the process at a high level. And I think that a high level is important because it really ties into asking on behalf of the end user because somebody that's a subject matter expert you still may know some of the knowledge when you're speaking with a subject matter expert, but it's a lot easier to go into it thinking, I know nothing about what this person is saying. That way you can leverage that subject matter expert to come down a couple of levels and talk in more of a, a synthesized manner. So that then that may lead to some other questions once, well, what did you mean by that? And you know, this last question, can you give me an example? And then going back to the mantra, is just asking what just happened. Take a step for a second and see if you can pause for a moment and just ask yourself what's just occurred. And it's okay to pause during interviews because either they're thinking, you're thinking, it's fine. I know in this Zoom community, a pause is like, well, we gotta fill that noise and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll find that sometimes uh, you get overwhelmed um, and that can be a good thing because that means you don't understand the depth of what they're describing or the issues they're experiencing yet. So just ask questions. Um, don't feel like they're stupid questions. Whatever point that you don't get, just um, just ask about it. And that kind of builds um, builds a sort of confidence in the speaker that you care about their perspective. And you're also saying that they know a lot about something. Um, so that helps quite a bit. And it ties into that humble inquiry, which is building a relationship. You really are going into it not knowing the answer. And that is a, 
that is a challenging thing to do as knowing what the business goals are. You probably already know what the technical constraints are on a project. So thinking about that, those, you know, that the three degrees of user experience that user need, once again, trying to uncover does take some thought process. And that's why, you know, asking questions in a way, number one is going to help develop some of that serendipity. Yeah. So, um, so you're going to sort of understand things differently and you're going to learn things you weren't expecting to learn there. Um, when you start asking those kinds of questions that are based on putting yourselves in the person's shoes, um, uh, also makes a user comfortable. So, um, so when you're asking empathetic questions, they feel like, again, you care about what they're saying, you care about their perspective and their opinion, and you care about their experiences in detail. Um, and that will make most people feel very comfortable. Um, in that comfort, it builds trust. Um, so when you are making someone feel comfortable, they're more likely to trust you and they're more likely to be vulnerable and share issues that they have that they may not share otherwise. Uh, especially around this sort of emotional context. Um, it opens up a deeper line of questioning. So uh, we've been talking about this throughout, but when you, um, when you ask those questions the right way, um, you open up more questions. And you ask questions the right way by, again, um, putting yourselves in that person's shoes, imagining doing the thing they're describing, and looking for those gaps in your understanding. Um, it also leads to accurate information. The deeper the line of questioning, the more accurate the information you get. Right. And we talked about earlier about the, the different research methods and the level of effort and the reliability. And as you start moving up and you start doing more face-to-face -face communications with end users, reliability is going to go up because you can ask follow-up questions. The key here, though, is, as Tony was saying, is that all these things need to be part of that follow-up question process. And it will allow you to go deeper into those lines of questioning, which then will increase your reliability of information. Because I've definitely done in the past some interviews where some question said I didn't go one level down the path, and then it could lead to some rework later because there was something that was left uncovered that if you just would have done maybe the fifth why, or you would have gone another direction, even deeper, you could have uncovered that information. And it, it could be costly if the questions aren't asked at the precise timing, because once more and more people get involved in your project, the more it costs. Yeah, and speaking of timing, um, so I talked about overwhelm, and um, you may find that um, you are being overwhelmed by what they're saying, don't be afraid to stop them. We talked about space, but don't, free, don't be afraid to stop the person in the middle of their, um, respectfully in the middle of their statement to say, okay, I don't understand that. Can you say it a different way or can you explain it in a different way um, so I can understand it? Because I'm really interested in, in knowing exactly what your perspective is. As, as long as it's not John Wayne, the researcher that's the Duke. <laughs> Exactly. Interrupting. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's done in a, as we said, a humble inquiry type of methodology or mentality, then you'll be able to you know, really follow up and ask the those that right framework of questions. So we didn't want to dive into and give you kind of a summary of what we talked about, so we can leave some time if there's any specific questions. So we'll give you a moment as we're going through our key takeaway. If you have any questions that you're thinking about, we're more than you're willing to jump in and answer some of those questions, but we didn't want to go through, which if I were at a, a wedding, one of the, the famous songs, right around the end, you're going to end on a high note, you bring all the folks out to sing New York, New York. You know, I've done Sweet Caroline, you know, there's so many songs you can, you can end an event on. Once, depending on the audience and what the, the couple would like you to play, but this is one of those classics that's out there. So, Let's take a look at, Tony, we talked about the value of UX research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Mark mentioned earlier, there's a competitive advantage. Um, not everyone is doing UX research at all. The folks that are doing it aren't always doing it in a way that produces the uh, amount of insights that it could produce. Um, in getting those insights, you're able to design a pleasant, productive experience. Um, so pleasant that it's nice 
and productive and that it actually makes the work or the activity more efficient. Um, and then you minimize rework. So that actually is an ROI thing um, where you're not spending more money on development, you're getting those insights early on. So there's minim uh, minimization of the actual rework that has to happen. Mm -hmm. So tips on how to ask questions. We talked about planning your time. So again, that goes into context and user expectations and um, needs and then your own goals for the research. Um, then the five whys, we talked about root cause analysis. So really getting at the essence of a problem that's been identified or one that you expect to happen potentially. Um, getting at how they feel about the product um, or service. Um, so that emotional reaction um, and sort of designing for an emotional reaction. So that persuasion, emotion, trust. Um, then we talk about the mantra and humble inquiry, what just happened? So building that relationship we talked about a lot of different strategies for building our relationship. Um, so kind of look back on those things and kind of focus on those as you're doing research and then understanding influences. So we talked about story curve. We talked about that attention span being shorter. Um, so just key in on that um, and keeping your research as, as um, concise as possible. Um, and yeah, then as we said, Oh, go ahead. We could do a whole presentation on understanding influences. Right. <laughs> there's there's yeah. a lot more to unpack, but we want to give you a little flavor of it. So there's an understanding of those both sides. And then last but not least, we had why it's important to ask them the right way. Yep. So developing that serendipity, you learn things you weren't expecting to, uh, making the user comfortable and building trust. So again, it's about that relationship that gets established that opens up a vulnerable mentality and perspective. Um, when you're asking questions the right way, it leads to a deeper line of questioning because again, you're in the user's shoes. We say that a lot um, and you hear it a lot in UX, but, um, but we want you to think about it in that specific way of imagining yourself doing the thing they're describing. And then um, it also leads to accurate information. So you're asking questions the right way. You're not leading, you're not, um, um, you know, getting people confused and things like that, um, you get some more accurate information. <laughs> so back to the mantra, what just happened? Uh, try imagining what they're doing to create clarifying questions so you can then investigate. Yeah, and this mantra, this is something, you know, as Tony and I were collaborating on this presentation, this mantra naturally occurred. And I think it's something that, like we said, it takes training, it takes some involvement, but understanding the value of research, then understanding you got to carve the time out and then figuring out how those questions are, keeping this in mind at all times will help reflect back and help you reset and understand how to properly conduct that research. So write this down. I know I have, and I'm continually thinking about it. So we wanted to keep in mind that curiosity is the key. If you think about it, staying curious, as we talked about through the entire day, the fact that if you're going into it with this a nature of want to build that relationship with that end user, want to understand really what are the things that you don't know and what are the things that they don't know? That curiosity is really something powerful to build on. And it can help not only on a dance floor, keeping people going, walking up to the couple throughout the night. How are things going? Is there anything that could be done? Asking, you know, what, you know, where are the party animals? What about the, the birthday for, you know, Uncle Vinny? Special things like that. And then flip that, go to your product. You know, what about this base of end users? What are they doing currently right now? What are some of the challenges they are facing? All those things can come together and build a better product. So we wanted to thank you. And we are gonna be raffling off a book here in a second and giving you an opportunity. If you wanna know more about all those UX research techniques, this is something that we've worked together to really share, shine a light and bring an analogy to you on how, believe it or not, thinking like a DJ DJing a wedding reception can also dovetail over into how to become 
a better UX pro. So Carrie Ann, flip it back to you, see if there's any questions out there and wanted to thank you for the opportunity. And uh, Tony, I don't know if you had any parting words at all. No, just thanks again, Carrie Ann, and um, appreciate everyone listening in and um, looking at our presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them. You can also reach out to us later on if you have anything. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, I did notice that we do have at least one question. Um, Alicia would like to know if you could give us a quick example of the methodologies you mentioned. Of some of the methodology, sure. methodologies that you mentioned. Sure. So I think the three that we mentioned were root cause analysis, the humble inquiry, and PET. Just want to make sure that's correct. And I will, I'll talk a little bit about humble inquiry and just an example of that. So one example is when you are specifically going to talk to an end user. So give you an example is I am watching someone work. So I'm on an observation. They're going through sharing how they do their job. And there may be some clarifying questions that may occur while I'm on the call, or if I'm once calm down, you go in person, but you may ask somebody, what was that you just clicked on there? And you honestly want to know what they just did. Where, what was that? How did they click on that? And they'll say, oh yeah, I just, this is an application. I know it by heart. And that's the one thing with observations is that everyone does things because it's muscle memory that they're not even thinking when they're going through there. So asking a quick clarifying question like that, and if they explain to you what it is, write it down, and then later on through, so you know, maybe you go 10, 15 minutes, they're just working, circle back to that question. If you see something happen on the screen and you could say, hey, I know earlier you said that this application did this. And they'll, yeah, actually, yeah, it, I, I'm glad you asked me that. And then they'll, could point you to, it could, actually impact a relationship to another application. So what, what that does is one is it builds some trust with the person that you're working with because they say, hey, they listened to me. They wrote that thing down. Most people forget things in 10 minutes. They actually remembered. And then they asked a key follow-up question onto that. So you are constantly just thinking on behalf of that end user because you know you have business goals that either the application is gonna get redesigned or something's going to happen, that you now have an opportunity to make a quick shift and apply what you just learned to that end user. Tony, did you wanna talk about five whys or, or PET? Sure, um, so I'll talk about PET first. Um, so I'll use the same example, someone's interacting with something at, at work um, and they're trying to accomplish some task, um, so same thing happens, they skip through something or they're interacting with something and they kind of move quickly. With PET, you wanna dig into it from an emotional context. Um, so you ask them, um, you know, what happened there to start with? Um, and they tell you, and then you say, um, okay, well, why do you think um, that happened? Until you get to the point where you can ask them, why do you, um, feel a certain way about this or how do you feel about it? So they may say, I feel anxious about this particular section. I've never thought about it before, but I feel really anxious. Then you try to investigate that anxiety um, and you say, okay, you're feeling anxious. Can you describe that anxiety? Um, you may get to the point where there's some kind of root um, issue like um, timing. Maybe there's a timer in the system that gives them anxiety because at a previous job, they were being timed on everything, and this timer may not be timing them on anything specific, but uh, maybe something that's frustrating them, um, giving them anxiety. Could be the content, the wording, um, the way things are phrased in the system that takes them back. And with that relationship, they may open up about something in their personal lives. And PET actually gets into that to the point where sometimes people end up crying because it's almost like a therapeutic thing where you're going deep into their experiences experiences to pull out um, these insights um, that you can then apply to 
redesigning something or designing something in the first place. Um, so root cause analysis, if we look at the same scenario, um, there's some problem in the system. And now we're doing something similar, but we're not necessarily going to focus on emotion. We're going to focus on their interpretation of that problem and why it's happening. So, so they may be clicking on something or not clicking on something that you expect them to and you ask them why. They say, well, there's so many, uh, there's so many systems I have to go into. I don't really ever remember to click on that. Um, and you ask them why there are so many systems and they may tell you, uh, well, there's a lot of complexity to my job, you know, and to the things that I do. And you ask them why, and they say, well, um, there's a lot of different goals coming from the business. Um, and you can go deeper and deeper. Um, as Michael had mentioned, it doesn't necessarily have to be five, but you want to get at that sort of essence of the problem. So you may end up talking to the business and say, well, you know, your workers are um, kind of overwhelmed by all of these systems. Can you prioritize the goals that you have so that they can focus on fewer systems to go into so they don't miss out on interacting with certain um, certain key components um, and maybe mess up an order or something like that. Uh, so those are a few examples. Hopefully they're helpful uh, to you guys. Good question. Yeah, that was helpful to me for sure. Um, did, okay, did anyone else have any questions? I'm looking and I'm not seeing any in the, in the right. chat. Um, so as a last, a couple of last bits of housekeeping. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Mark and Tony. And if anyone has any questions for them, um, that not only is their contact information on the cards um, that on their profiles on Vito, but you can also put information in the um, discussion on their topic, or you can also always reach out to me because everyone should have my contact information and I can put you in touch with them if you can't find their contact information. 